Welcome to National Arts. I'm Mike Baker. The 1994 Tony for Best Musical goes to Passion. ...was made possible by... Welcome to National Arts. I'm Mike Baker. The 1994 Tony for Best Musical goes to Passion, with Tony Award-winning music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and book by James Lapine, who also garnered a Tony. The story is based on the 19th century Italian novel about a lonely invalid who directs all her attentions toward a dashing young soldier. When the soldier is torn between his pity for her and his affections for his lover in Milan, all characters are forced to make difficult choices. We are indeed fortunate on National Arts to have Donna Murphy with us, who won the Tony for her portrayal as Pasca, and Jerry Shea, who portrayed the soldier, and Marin Mazzi, the lover. Loving you is not a choice. It's who I am. trying to compare the dialogue with the sung text mm -hmm. to, to get a feel for the kinds of emotions which are expressed in each. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but liken the sung dialogue to what song's all about, and that is an opening of the heart. And we get a lot of the raw emotions in the songs. Mm -hmm. We really do. Yeah. Well, when you add the element of music, it inherently heightens a moment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think a, a good creative team wants to make the most of of what is just inherent in, in, in adding music and that it's going to heighten the moment. So what do why why would a person make that take that step up? Well to reveal something, um, to to say something in a way that they haven't said it prior to that. That's that's the beauty of, of musical theater. You know? How can somebody so radiant? such as yourself, turn your heart inside out every night. Have you ever thought that maybe in, in a certain way that you are the spokesperson for an awful lot of people out there that are ignored because they don't have the looks, but have the heart? I know that the show moves a lot of people, and I know that it, um, I remember when we did the workshop, my best friend came and saw the show, and she was very upset after the show. She just, I mean, in a good way, I say. I was very moved by it, and she said, Donna, I'm sitting here, and as I was waiting for you to come out, I was thinking about people I sit on the subway with, and people who, for one reason or another, um, I'm compelled to, to watch, and she's an artist as well, and, and people who I'm, for one reason or another, quicker to dismiss, and seeing this show just made me realize there are these people with these vibrant lives inside of them who um, are not necessarily not given the opportunity to reveal that, but not given the kind of opportunity that, let's face it, people with uh, everything in, in place in a way that society at a given moment has decided is more palatable, um, there are more opportunities for them. But loving you, I have a goal. familial background it's almost amazing that she could flourish at all mm. and that she's in the state that she is mm -hmm. I mean a, a, a good number of the emotionally induced illnesses come from the way we're raised the way we're treated right. and an awful lot of that I would imagine is in her head she was blessed in that her parents loved her but they um, what they what they gave to her in terms of what they saw how they perceived her um, and so how she came to value herself was warped. 
and um, she had a mother and a father who said, you're so beautiful, it's dangerous, you have to be careful, you're so beautiful. They didn't say, you're, you have such a fine mind. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what a great personality. <laughs> uh, other things that she might have developed a sense of worth about. So when she reached a time in her life when you know, the, the kind of mirror was raised in a way that was difficult for her to handle, she didn't have anything else to, to, to hold on to, to say, well, this is valuable about me. This, this is purposeful in my life. This I have to offer to someone. And, um, and so she felt that there really wasn't a reason for her to exist, except perhaps to, to bring misery to other people. Because in the way that, uh, that, she, that she feels, the depth with which she feels things, her face and her heart are incompatible. Why this combination? It's a wonderful analysis of the yeah. situation. There's a very, and I hadn't seen this alluded to anywhere else, but I noticed that there's this very subtle change in your character mm -hmm. as she is uh, beginning to experience love for the first time, mm -hmm. unrequited or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, first, there's the change from the drab green to a more mm, cream, and then eventually mm -hmm. as you visit Giorgio, uh, in your last letter, there's mm -hmm. a more uplifting color. Yeah. And also, they say that we lose our afflictions as we pass on to the other life. Mm -hmm. You are more erect when you come back in that right. last letter. I, I, didn't, I didn't want her suddenly to sweep on stage, you know, um, backlit and uh, mm -hmm. um, in white. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted her to be freed, though. And, and in in my mind, even the day she died, the day she let go of life, she probably sat up straighter. I mean, there was a weakness in it, but she wasn't holding on to the pain. She wasn't defining herself by her illness anymore. I know you don't like the word obsession, and so we're going to stay away, away from that altogether. You heard but, that, huh? but it has <laughs> many times, I'm sure. But it has been said that the way you tackled this part was with the same sort of obsession. Uh, that Fosca has for Giorgio. Well, obsession. Maybe it's okay. because it was a stretch for you. I mean, having come from two roles where you had to outwardly play your sexuality, mm -hmm. here you had to draw within. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe for that reason, you felt you had to work a little harder. I don't know. Um, I tend to always. Uh, I'm, I love research, mm -hmm. and so if I'm doing the most lighthearted, you know, piece of fluff. Um, I've been teased by other cast members about, you know, the books I'm carrying around <laughs> and uh, the time I spend, whatever, you know, going to film libraries and stuff because that's what stimulates my imagination and that's what enables me to feel like I can get lost in that world. Otherwise, I'd be scared to death. Mm -hmm. It's why, you know, people have, because I sing, people would say, you know, why haven't you done a club act or something? Because the thought of standing on stage as me for an hour and in a very kind of naked way, uh, um, it's, it's not as scary as it used to be, but I like, I like getting lost in the world of a character. If I'm able to take the time to read literature of the period, to read Freud and Boyer's studies of hysteria, to, um, to feel like I have some sense of what that time was about, what it was like for a woman in that time, um, and and this whole condition of hysteria, and to to understand it in a way where I I believe that I can um, live there. The key to me is I have to buy it, and if I can buy it, then other people can buy it. George is a sensitive person. I mean, there's even a, a remark made by Fosca that the other soldiers hear drums and you hear music. You're sensitive about nature and all those other elements. It's a direct contradiction of terms when you assess the fact that you're also in this military regiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that yeah. tough to portray? It is, you know, I th well, I think in a way it, it makes all the sense in the world. You know, people do in life, and I know at times in my life, um, squeeze themselves into roles that they, uh, it just roles in life, maybe professionally or personally, that they don't quite feel comfortable in. And there was so much pressure in, in Giorgio's life from his family and the history of the family and the sense of pride and honor and dignity that he would, uh, you know, he was a, a square peg in a round hole. Uh, he was kind of pressured into uh, the military. It's, it's unfortunate that you're not necessarily ostracized, but you don't have the camaraderie of the other soldiers because they can't identify with your sensitivity. Mm -hmm. They don't want to try to identify <laughs> with your Absolutely sensitivity. Not. And it's unfortunate. I mean, you are an island unto yourself. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that is, is Giorgio's own, uh, you know, he's mm -hmm. perpetuated that whole thing. I think he would rather it that way. It's so much easier than dealing with people. Uh, I think uh, Fosca, his relationship with Fosca is a more um, intense uh, form, more concentrated form of that, and more obvious to the people. Oh, you know, those two are going to clash, but then he has these little uh, scrapes of people along the way throughout the show, and uh, it makes it interesting, though. A lot of subtext in this role. Yeah. There's an, a, lot, a lot of emotions, which I'm sure the director said, I don't want you showing this, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. physically. I want you to feel this. The audience will get the impact. Um, that must have been that must have been terribly difficult at times. It helps when you have great writing, and I think that's what this has proven to be. You know, it's it's been a, a difficult process um, in a lot of ways, but the uh, for the most part, the uh, the script, the book, and the, and the lyrics have been there and, and uh, really supported that whole idea of just being in the moment. Um, and that's you know the way good acting should be. You should. Not try to try to uh, sell an idea to anybody. Just uh, have it happening to you inside, and ultimately, will it will reflect. You make the comment that respect uh, has everything to do with love, or vice versa, and all of a sudden you're faced with someone that you perceive to have no respect but in reality they have a very strong will mm -hmm. uh, it just it says an awful lot about the really the, the misconceptions about what men and women think and feel and, right. and their a certain amount of self-respect for one another mm -hmm. it's, it's rather interesting and it's also a very it always strikes me as a very rational thing for him to say too and which is his game you know he likes to keep things and uh, he likes to label everything and, and keep it at a safe distance and and you know respect and, and compassion he thinks he has an idea of exactly what everything is when in fact he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't uh, take stock of what he's feeling he's always up here one thing that i think might get lost here if we don't bring it out and that is uh the whole business of reciprocity you can love someone um and yet if they don't love you back you assume that they're they're in their own little world and they don't have problems they're experiencing pain too mm -hmm. even though they're not returning the love they're going through a tremendous amount of turmoil mm -hmm. and i think you exemplify this for mm -hmm. us in the play yeah and we sometimes forget the feelings of those who can't give love back they want to so badly right. and yet they can't mm -hmm. and so you do uh i think you embellish this somewhat and, and exemplify for us good good yeah it, it's a it's something that I, i've come across especially as an as uh, an actor um in my training and things uh, there would be directors who would be like, don't you want to do this? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to put out for us here? And it's like, yes, yes, I do, but you don't know how much it hurts to not be able to. And, and it's like you're going to explode. And if you don't have a way to channel it and, and focus it and invent it, it's, it's worse. There's another point, too, from a male point of view, and that is there's great beauty, obviously, in the soul. But to, to get beyond the physical trappings and what we're taught to perceive to get to the heart of the matter and all the das machina around us mm -hmm. is difficult mm -hmm. so we understand that in your character mm -hmm. yeah it's uh another one of those ways that he labels things he, he, he likes to keep it uh, at a distance but also you know of course the ideal relationship will have uh, involved two beautiful people mm -hmm. and uh and who can say all the pretty things and all of those pretty promises and uh, you know that the idea of of the perfect love I think the uh, the most confusing thing is, you know, especially at the end when he realizes, yeah, you know, I don't want to ruin a plot for anybody. But, <laughs> you know, he says, yes, I, I, I do love you. It's, it's a shock. It's like, how can I find a perfect love in the most unlikely of, of people, you know? 
I think the one thing that you're um, insistent that people take away is that, yes, physically we may be unclothed initially, mm -hmm. but what they should take away from this is that you are raw to the bone, mm -hmm. totally unclothed in the end, yeah. emotionally. Yeah. That's where the true nakedness is. That was a big, uh, that was a big catchphrase in, in rehearsals. I remember. Uh, it's true. You know, I, I was concerned with uh, the nudity at the beginning uh, being done well, and I had no doubt that it would be. But of course, you know, nothing like going through it. And it was the first time for me to ever do anything, of, of, you know, with that physicality uh, on stage, and, and it was. Um, being a concern, I, I, you know, had that much more concern for the end. Really, um, even out balancing it, uh, so you don't even, you don't, you don't kind of go away even remembering the beginning. You just kind of find yourself at the end of this play and exhausted and, and cracked open. Just another love story. That's what they would play. Another simple love story. Marin, when we first see you at the outset of the play in your very tender moment with Giorgio, right. um, it's clear that you, you beat as one heart, you sing as one voice, and yet you're saying different things, aren't you? Yes, we are definitely saying different things. I think, you know, I'm saying, I mean, from the very beginning that we ever should have met as a miracle, he's saying it's inevitable. I mean, to me, it's sort of like this, I, I look at it as sort of this, this gift that's been given to me because this, the, of that part of my life that's missing. Um, which we don't really get to know that much uh, about that part of Clara's life. And, um, I mean, so this is a lot of things that I've, I've worked on in, 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 as making her a real person. But, um, yeah, I think that's, that's what, and also sort of sets up, it sets up the piece in the way of you see these two people in this, this beautiful scene making, having just made love, and it's, it's all rapture, and we're so in love and everything. But, yes, we are saying totally different things. And we are sort of making fun of, we're saying, oh, this is just another thing, love story. You know, like everyone's going to say that. But, but I'm saying, no, no, this is more. But then it's, oh, no, it's like every other love story. And yeah, I mean, our, our reasonings, everything is, is sort of, of different. And so it, it does sort of set it up that this isn't going to be so, this is not going to be so happy through the whole thing. This, this, isn't, the, this isn't the love. This isn't, the, something's going something's to take a turn. They say you can know people by watching their actions and listening to what they say, and really listening to what they say. Right. And if you listen to what Giorgio says, he's singing to you, but he's saying in a very visceral way, you're so beautiful, right. you're so beautiful, right. over and over again. Mm -hmm. You're thinking more of the bigger picture and the content of the relationship. Right. He's thinking more of the wow. beauty and the visceral this element. This woman is lovely, yes. <laughs> and, and so I think, I think we get an idea of his naivete here, right. and that, it, you know, what happens when the beauty fades, or what happens when the initial um, relationship gets underway. Right, right. And then when he, when he goes mm -hmm. off and he meets, and he meets Fosca, and this is someone tapping something that he's capable of, obviously, getting in touch with, but no one's ever challenged that in him before. Isn't and it interesting in their most intimate moment how they're, they're just singing right by each other? Mm -hmm. And what that says, not just for the period, but for today, right. in terms of the communication between sexes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is, I mean, it is uh, I mean, just from my own experience, hearing something, it is said totally different. I can say something, it's interpreted by the man in a totally different way, and vice versa. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing. It's not, we're not hearing it at all what, what the other is saying. I thought I knew what love was. I always wonder if the other person is saying what the other one wants to hear or if it's what they really feel. And then we even see that more with Fosca in his pleasantries to her. I mean, right. it's not what he's feeling, but he's saying these things because he feels He feels obligated to. He feels yeah, obligated. I mean, and then that all is tied up in every relationship that we have. What's real and what's right. expected. And, right, right. You know, what are we really thinking? Well, especially, at, and I, I mean, I think from that time, especially from a woman's point of view, women were expected to say certain things. 
And I mean, as the character, as I build her through the piece, I mean, there, through, through the letters I'm receiving from him, I'm constantly hearing about this other woman. Now, I would like to hope that being a woman of 1994, I would be saying, okay, who is this person? <laughs> What's going on here? But no, Clara yes. keeps it all in, mm -hmm. has to. I mean, she can't, well, for one thing, she's married, so I mean, it really isn't her place to say, you know, is, is there someone else in your life? And, and but, but she sees it in him, and she sees that someone else is taking over him, and, and that ends up becoming what ruins their relationship. You know, beauty is power. Mm -hmm. What we choose to do with it is really what dictates our life. Right. And I think how, I mean, beauty is a lot of different things. I mean, certainly a, a physical beauty is, is one thing. But boy, as we learn in this piece, the inner beauty, I mean, and I think that's, I think that's what's powerful about beauty in any way, is how, exactly how you use it, but how you feel about it inside and where that comes from. And I think for Clara, that's all she has at this point. Uh, she, that's really what she's got and has to use, even though there, there are other feelings, but she's so confined and what she, she, her boundaries are so small. I mean, she really can't go beyond a lot because she'll, she'll lose everything. She really will. If the audience had a subtext, do you sense when we find out uh, through Giorgio that you are married? Do you feel it in the audience? I feel a little, it's funny because I'm certainly not, I'm not on stage when that little moment happens. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, just from having people in the audience say there's a little, <gasps> yeah. oh, <laughs> she's not the perfect thing that mm -hmm. we thought she was. Mm -hmm. And then I do because then, and that's sort of my turning point too for yeah. her. I mean, I think because things start, because Fosca starts to really get into our relationship. She starts to move her little path and it starts to divide it does that's where it all takes takes the turn and i think definitely it has that oh well if this isn't <laughs> this is not this is more complicated than we really thought it was you know given the time she's a major risk taker mm -hmm. we wouldn't necessarily oh. associate that with today but at that juncture she is huge and that and and i mean to to go and meet someone in a private place to receive letters from them mm -hmm. I mean, oh, it's all very scandalous. I mean, it really is. I mean, she's really, ta she is. She's really, she's really putting a lot on the line. But she's so taken. I think, I mean, it really, to her, it is, it's kind of, it's an obsession also, I think, this relationship. Because it's, it's something that's so unknown to her and, and feelings that she's never dealt with before. We recognize, I think, as an audience, your beauty. So we admire you. We hear you're married and maybe we're somewhat aghast mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. But we're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt because you are taking this major risk and we assume that you love Giorgio. Right. However, when you say <laughs> that, Giorgio, we must each carve out our own place in life, right. I think we begin to admonish you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think definitely. It's mm -hmm. like, well, this is, the, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, it's in a place. It's in a place in her life. It isn't, mm -hmm. it isn't, no, I'm not going to, I mean, when, in the scene right before it, Fosca says, I will die for you. Would Clara do that? Well, she says in the next scene, no, she wouldn't. She's not even going to leave her husband. She's not going to take that risk, even though he's saying everything's possible, which he has said to her before, and which she's relishing these words that he's, he's said to her, um, that they can have it all, that they really can, can do it. But obviously that's not how she feels. That's not what she, she doesn't see it that way. And he just doesn't quite see it the same way. The play and your portrayal, and that obviously of the character of Giorgio, says an awful lot about your maturity as an adult mm -hmm. um, and as a person who can have an outside relationship, in that you have this relationship on stage, and yet you're able to have a very self-sustaining relationship in the outside world and to come together and have this ability to do this. And that, I think that represents tremendous maturity on your part and also on the part of the other character. Well. I think, yeah, I mean, I think the, the way that, that, it, that it's written, that it's formed, and uh, it's all supportive. I mean, and have, have, having great people mm -hmm. in, in, and trust and all of that in, in the piece. Um, it really, it really trust, just... Trust, there you go, good yeah, word. Yeah, it really makes it... I mean, that's certainly a big one for this one, I think. You know, there's this, this informal 
clash of Sondheim actresses, and it's like the who's who among great singers and performers, <laughs> of which you've joined now. You're in your second. I mean, you are. You're a real soldier now, having yeah. done two. Well, actually, the, I did Mar I did Merrily We Were Alone. Yeah, so both three revivals of that, right. out, out of town, right. so you know, La Jolla and third. Arena. So this is my third. I'm a lucky Obviously, girl. Obviously, when they cast <laughs> that, did it have some bearing, your portrayal, <laughs> your portrayals in other shows of his? Um, I think I think definitely having knowing me and knowing my voice and I this is the this is the third time I've worked with, with James and Stephen together so um, I certainly think that helps and, and knowing how I work and and that kind of thing and it ended up I mean also boy it just I ended up being really right for the role and so I mean all of it kind of came together you can concentrate way. a little bit more on your psychological work and less on the uh, vocal calisthenics and right one exactly <laughs> Thank you for joining us on National Arts. I hope you enjoyed meeting Donna, Marin, and Jerry in this beautiful and seamless epic about love and passion. Until next time, remember, art was meant to be appreciated, so you be a part of it. has been made possible by the Hotel Edison, with 1,000 rooms in the heart of the theater district just off Broadway between 46th and 47th Street. An American Art Review, available at bookstores and chronicling the emergence and growth of American painting, drawing,